Well, I want to add my welcome as well. My name is John Bryson. I'm the lead pastor here at Fellowship Memphis, and we're excited for all of you moms and want to thank you moms for being what you are. And uh, I'm incredibly blessed to have an amazing mother all of my life and uh, felt incredibly supported by her always uh, uh, in my corner and teaching me things as well, entrepreneur, things that mattered, uh, fought uh, valiantly for decades in the educational world, fighting for the uh, underprivileged, and uh, she's just an incredible role model to me. Um, we're excited today to continue, Denny come on up and grab a seat, uh, drawing your attention to things that we care deeply about here at Fellowship Memphis during this Engage uh, site. As those designated to take the offering, I'll remind you that a couple weeks ago we started Engage and we looked at, uh, we've been looking at things like our residency program, like World Missions. Uh, we've been looking at uh, just those initiatives that that fund funds, uh, but they also point us and remind us to what matters to us here. And today we're going to be talking about local missions and I'm excited for you to learn about a big piece of that, which is our initiatives uh, on the campuses, the college campuses uh, with campus outreach, and we're going to tell you about that, and I think you're going to be deeply excited. Thank you last week for making your way to Levitt Shell. We had a ball down in the middle of the city, uh, served over 1,800 lunches. Sorry if you didn't get a lunch, but it was an amazing time for all of our outposts to be together. Then next Sunday, uh, we'll begin drawing our attention as spring becomes summer toward our, what we call uh, our FM summer campaign. We'll have a bunch of t-shirts we're giving out next week, so you're not going to want to miss that. Uh, we've got some mystery shirts that are coming, uh, so you'll definitely want to be here. And then uh, we do things a little differently in the summer. We have a lot of fun. So at each of our outposts, at every single service for the 12 Sundays that are part of the summer, we have a pop-up party. So those will start in June, gives us a chance to celebrate local vendors, uh, have some great treats and a little extra time after each service to just hang out and get to know each other. So we really embrace our summers here and are really excited about them. We're going to kick off this morning uh, with uh, drawing your attention, letting Denny and some of the students share uh, what's happening here in the college campuses. College ministry is so strategic. Uh, many of you began your walk with the Lord in college. Uh, some of you know I spent 11 years as a co campus pastor doing a lot of what Denny does. Uh, that season of life is so such a vulnerable time, such an opportunistic time. Uh, many of us, the ha patterns, the habits we began in college really mark us for the rest of our life. Uh, if you're a parent, you'll know the vulnerability. I would see it in their eyes and hear it in their voice as they hand it off for the first time an 18-year-old to live on their own. Uh, and I'm grateful for people like Denny and his team and Campus Outreach who are creating gospel communities and pursuing our 18 to 22-year-olds or so uh, in such an amazing way. And then finally, I'll just tell you in church history, if you look at America, every single major revival in America started on a college campus, and so God tends to do amazing things on a college campus. So if you want to dig into church history, you can read about some of those. But Denny, let's start. Tell us a little bit about you, a little bit about campus outreach, uh, and educate fellowship this morning on kind of what we're doing to reach collegians. Yeah, first of all, uh, just thank you for investing uh, so heavily over the years into uh, fellowship, but also in Engaged Memphis. Um, a little bit of my story, I, I didn't grow up in church, and so coming to uh, Memphis um, and having someone invite me to a campus outreach Bible study was, was new and fresh for me, um, and uh, so that was my first experience with the gospel uh, from what I can remember, uh, and so I started following Christ at the University of Memphis my junior year, uh, and then plugged in here to, to Fellowship Memphis back when we were at... Um, uh, over at Crichton, yeah. uh, so that was uh, my first uh, time coming to fellowship, and uh, and so since then we've been on staff here. My wife and I and our three kids we've been here in Memphis, uh, hoping to build uh, a few things. We're hoping to build laborers, um, and so you know our vision statement with campus outreach is is from Matthew nine thirty six to thirty eight. Is as Jesus looks out on the crowds, it says that he has compassion on them uh, because they're harassed and helpless. They're like sheep without a shepherd. Uh, and then he turns to his men and he says, now let's pray for the Lord to raise up laborers for the harvest. Um, so what we've been doing at the University of Memphis, Rhodes, and other campuses in the region is just praying that God would raise up uh, an army of laborers to reach the world. Um, and in the same sense, we're, we're, our hope is to build franchises. And we do that through um, multiplying our campus ministries, but also franchising our model uh, into various places around the world. Um, I've got a picture here of our staff team. This is a... Uh, this is our staff. We've got about well, we've got 34 staff um, that are that are here in the Memphis region, and they are everywhere from uh, Murray State University to Southeast Missouri State to to Arkansas State University to Middle Tennessee State. 
Um, and then here locally, we're at the University of Memphis uh, and Rhodes College. And so we've got some, some of our uh, folks here. They're going to share a little bit about those ministries. Awesome. Well, tell us a little bit about what all you all do to reach collegians, kind of your strategy, what you do during the school year. I know New Year's Eve's really big. Uh, the conference and the summers are real strategic. So kind of walk us through a strategic year for campus outreach. Sure. So picking up on the on the last thing. So our, our, our staff are placed at all these different campuses. I think we've got a, a picture of uh, these are the campuses that I mentioned. Um, and these are the places that, that from the beginning when Campus Outreach Memphis started, uh, we kind of planted our feet at SEMO and Murray, and Murray State. And since then, as, as students have come to Christ, they have, they have, uh, some have come on staff with us and we've begun to, to navigate different campuses. Um, from there, through the evangelism and discipleship process, uh, we've seen multiple generations of, of laborers raised up, but also regions. Uh, so this next picture is a place where uh, from Campus Outreach Memphis, uh, now new franchises have started, and those places have gone and franchised again. Uh, so, so over the last 10, 15 years, uh, it's turned into about 50 different college ministries um, around the U.S. that, that we've seen. Um, and so I'm primarily focused here on the Memphis one, uh, and I've got some, some testimonies that I'd love to invite up if you guys want to come up. And I, I, think, I think these guys can give you a little bit of a, a glimpse of, um, of what God uh, has done over the last couple of years. I've had the privilege to invest in these guys, and, and uh, I'd love for y'all to hear from them. Maybe we'll just take uh, less than two minutes apiece, apiece and, uh, and move down and, and share a story. Yeah, happy Mother's Day. Hey, you guys, um, scoot on my on name up. is Chase Preston. So, oh, sorry. so to clarify, we're not students. Uh, I graduated from the U of M about five years ago, so I got to the U of M in 2008, and a uh, similar story to Denny, came into college thinking that I was a Christian because I had family that Grew up in church, and my parents valued Christian things and valued spirituality, and I would say we were religious, but if you looked at my life, it was pretty clear that I wanted nothing to do with Jesus. So Ephesians 2, uh, I was dead in my trespasses and sins. I was following the course of the world, giving myself over to the typical college life. It was evident that I didn't have a relationship with, with Jesus. And so about my junior year, Denny and a couple other uh, older members of my fraternity began sharing the gospel with me, began walking uh, through scripture with me, began asking me hard questions about my eternity, about my purpose, my identity. And so after about a month or so, I uh, gave my life to Christ around the tail end of my junior year. And so after the discipleship process and getting trained and, and growing my faith, my wife and I went on staff with Campus Salary. So we've been on staff with CO for about five years now and laboring at the University of Memphis, primarily in the Greek system. And so just a little, little taste, a little story of God's faithfulness in the, at U of M campus. So Dewan is over here. He's a freshman uh, Sigma Chi at the University of Memphis. So about last fall, Dewan gave his life to Christ in about October. And so immediately after he gave his life to the Lord, we began praying and trusting God for the salvation of uh, the men in the fraternity. And so within the next six months, we saw about six guys profess, five other guys profess faith in Jesus Christ. And so it was, yeah, praise the Lord. And uh, it was exciting for both of us, but I think the most encouraging thing for us is to look back and to see that God used both of us. Um, and now there's a third generation of men currently in one fraternity following Jesus. And so now currently a mobilization coordinator uh, in the Memphis region. So we have CO distinctives, evangelize, establish, equip students to, to grow in their faith, and then export them out. So now I'll be working with graduating seniors, strategically placing them uh, in this city, and even hoping to place them strategically in the world to continue to impact um, regions for the gospel. Awesome. Hi, my name is Anthony Cabrera. Um, I did not grow up in Memphis. I grew up in Southern California, moved to Memphis in 2010. As a 22-year-old, broken, didn't have a relationship with God. Um, but uh, about two months into me being here in Memphis, um, at the University of Memphis, I met a guy in the weight room, happened to be that guy right over there. Um, and we just built this relationship that I didn't know was going to change my life. Um, he invited me over to his house for dinner, invited me to hang out and go to Bible studies on the same day, right after we uh, were done weightlifting. And um, we started, I started going to Bible studies with him and I uh, ended up meeting just a hundred, hundreds of college students. Uh, that had broken past just like me, even worse than me, uh, but had joy in their life, that had just a sense of hope that, was, um, that just shined from their life. And I was like, man, there's, uh, there's something different. And I can just, I could see that. And I knew that was what I was searching for. And um, just through building relationships with them, um, and uh, I was able to see what a real relationship with God looked like and what the gospel really was. And by God's grace, he just changed the whole trajectory of my life. Um, started to attend Fellowship Memphis with just a few students that um, I was going to these Bible studies with, and uh, 
And man, I've never been a part of such a diverse church, such a diverse body that, um, that was just so hands-on in the city. Um, and I got the diversity, I got the hard truth, I got community, and I've never had that in a church home before. Um, so I've been with Fellowship for a few years now, I've been a member here, I've been baptized here, been able to be, uh, been able to serve in the church, and I've never been able to do that before, and, um, and also seek the welfare of the city. Um, also, Fellowship Memphis has also helped me, just helped fund me a, across just uh, multiple conferences I've been to that Denny was mentioning, and just summer projects, and also my first mission trip to South Africa, uh, Fellowship Memphis helped me get there, and that just changed uh, my life missionally, just me seeing just um, how I wanted to uh, share the gospel and just, um, and just experience God in a whole different way. Um, and so what the future holds for me now, I'm actually being launched out with a um, expansion team to Chicago, and I'm going to be able to build a community there, just how I've seen here in Memphis, and just reach young men um, who were lost just like me and be able to get that opportunity to do that. So. Awesome. Well, uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I went to school at Rhodes College here. I'm actually currently coming here from Denver, Colorado. Um, but to catch you up very quickly on my story, my past, I grew up in a Christian home. And, and by that, I mean I had a very uh, intellectual knowledge of who Jesus was. I knew what the cross was about. I knew who Jesus was. My parents, you know, read the bedtime stories to me. Um, but to give you an idea, when I was in college my freshman year, uh, someone would come up to Denny and be like, hey, isn't that the guy you're investing in? Uh, no way, like, don't waste your time with him, he's far gone, he's not coming to Christ. That was me, that was my condition. Uh, but then he saw something in me and he kind of took me under his wing, he started to love me, he invited me into his life, I got to see his family, his, uh, his kids, he, he interested himself in what interested me. And through that process, about the same time I started coming to, to Fellowship Memphis, uh, I actually sat right over there with my friends, and, and that was at the time where, where Jesus saved my life. Uh, he saved me, he brought me out of my darkness, and he gave me life, and Fast forward about a year ahead of that, I went back to my football team, and what Denny had instilled in me, those values of just loving people, sharing Jesus, sharing faithful obedience and joy that I saw for, in his life and longed for, uh, at the end of that year, we actually had 12 men who were in discipleship groups and growing in their faith and committing their lives to Jesus. And so that was the first time in my life that I saw, man, this idea of, of discipleship, of multiplying my life that God talks about. Uh, believe it or not, he's right. And I saw that for the first time. I started to believe uh, in discipleship and the mission and the things that we were doing. Um, and so to catch you up on what I'm doing right now, I've, I've moved out to Denver, Colorado. I just finished my first year on staff of Campus Outreach where we have started Campus Outreach on those campuses for the first time ever. And, and God's doing the same thing there. Eight people came to Christ uh, in Denver, Colorado. And so God is doing much through this process and it, and it started with Denny investing in a broken guy like me. Um, so yeah, that's my story. My name is Michael Johnson, a very similar story to these guys. I was born and raised here in Memphis and for 18 years of my life claimed to be a Christian. Um, and I got into college my freshman year at the University of Memphis in 2011 and I joined the football team for a little bit. I joined a, a fraternity and really just continued pursuing the world and all that sin had to offer. And I'll never forget at a football tailgate one day, this old guy came up to me by the name of Brett Wynn. He was the director at the time at Memphis with Campus Outreach and asked me to go to Lenny's Sub Shop with him the next week for lunch. And it was free, so I couldn't say no. So I went with him. And through that relationship, seeing his life, he was sharing Jesus with me, sharing the gospel with me, and it was penetrating my heart, and I didn't like it. Uh, but that's when I realized that I didn't have Christ. Um, I was not given a new heart that Ezekiel 36 said. Uh, and so I gave my life to Christ my freshman year. And then Brett moved off, and then Denny, for the next three and a half years, discipled me. When I say discipled, he, he lived life on life with me. And uh, he taught me everything there was to know about the Bible. He taught me how to read the Bible, taught me how to pray, how to fight sin, um, how to build biblical convictions in my life, help me figure out what I wanted to do with my future. And so through that, he let me go to the, uh, taught me about Orlando Project, which we'll be going to again this summer. And at Orlando Project is when I was convinced, convinced of the Great Commission that God really has called us and saved us so that we can go and make disciples of all nations. So I came back to Memphis in my fraternity of ATO and started leading Bible studies. 
My first Bible study, there was three men, including myself, um, and then Chase and I, he was doing Bible studies with me. My last one, there was 40 guys there. So it was just so cool seeing God's faithfulness through that. Um, because of God's word and his commands to go make disciples, God led me to Arkansas State, where I'm at now, serve as a campus director. Um, and God is doing far more abundantly than all we could ask or imagine. Uh, this last year alone, we've seen 39 students come to Christ. Um, I do uh, ministry with a football team in the Greek system. Amen, right over there. <laughs> Amen. Uh, and just on the football team alone, 13 guys have come to Christ within the last year. Um, and so God is doing so much. And uh, I was actually a part of fellowship while here. I was here at Memphis. And so, uh, man, I'm, I'm all about it. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you all very much. Appreciate you. Um, I, I just, again, want to thank you for, for your investments. I mean, in, in a lot of our, our students, as they're students, they don't have necessarily the uh, the resources or the opportunities to grow in their faith um, and do uh, what you guys allow them to do. Um, so even this past year, you guys have been generous enough to invest in our students going to summer projects. Uh, these guys mentioned a little bit about the summer projects. Would love to highlight that. Um, we have two stateside projects, which is our Tampa and our Orlando projects. And, 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 and this primarily is an opportunity for students to grow for 10 weeks. Uh, many of you guys uh, here have, have actually gone to the Orlando Project, um, and it's 10 weeks of growth. We rent out an entire hotel floor. Uh, we get jobs at SeaWorld and Universal Studios, and we just throw down for 10 weeks. We do Bible studies. How do you share your faith? We go all around Orlando and, and learn how to engage people with the gospel, uh, and we build our teams in hopes to come back to the campus and do the same thing on our college campuses. Uh, we also have uh, cross-cultural projects. And these up here, this is our, um, you know, we've got our, our Thailand team over here. This is a, an old team. Um, we've got our 901 project, which is focused here in the city of Memphis, people coming into Memphis, um, which uh, we've seen 90% of our students who come to the 901 project to engage here and choose 901. 90% uh, of those attendees actually move to Memphis and plant their feet here, plug into local churches, serve in the city. Our South Africa team, huge opportunity, and then our, our East Asia team, uh, again, there's, there's Chase, and, and you probably noticed some of them in, in throughout here. But uh, these are our summer projects that we have going on this summer that you guys uh, allow to happen. It's awesome. Well, man, thanks for doing what you do. Yep. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, for each of these, we've wanted to not just share with you what we do corporately, those of us who support Engage Memphis, uh, what we're able to do corporately. But uh, we also want to kind of put a bow on these and kind of preach these on how we can apply these personally. So I'm going to kind of put a bow on this one and talk about how you and I can be involved in local missions. And my deep desire, our deep desire for you to see yourself as a local missionary, that where you live, where you play, where you work, the people God's brought around you, that's not an accident. And what does it mean for you and I to live out the gospel uh, every day that we're here in Memphis and to see ourselves living intentionally for his glory, that we look for opportunities. It's the most exciting part about being a Christian, that God doesn't just save us, but he repurposes our lives and uses you and I as light and salt and as ministers in the city. And so I want to talk about two verses this morning that are just foundational to us as a church. And the first one's found in Ephesians 4. Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians, and it's a foundational verse in defining who we are as a church and what the church is to be about. Um, and it reminds us that the church is not a building, the church is a people, a people called to walk with God and to represent God. Uh, corporate worship, what we're doing right now is important. This is the church gathered, and then what you and I go to live out the gospel the rest of the week is the church scattered. So the church in the building, it's, it's not an event, it's a family on mission, and you'll hear us talk about that all the time here at Fellowship Memphis. Uh, the first piece of that that really solidifies why we exist as a church is found, as I said, in Ephesians 4. It's, look at it with me. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers... For this purpose. So there are those that he uniquely gifts to uh, minister to the ministers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. So Paul does call some of us to work vocationally in the church, but our job is not necessarily to do ministry. Our job is to equip the saints, all those I'm looking at that call themselves Christians and Christ followers, to do the uh, work of the ministry, to build up the body of Christ. And so Ephesians 4 helps me understand that, helps us understand that. And it's super important that we see this. As God grows your heart, as 
you awaken to maybe some new desires to study your Bible or to share your faith and to help others grow spiritually or to step in areas of justice and seek the peace in our city and minister to the marginalized and the oppressed, that is good gospel growth in you. But that is not necessarily indications that you need to pursue vocational ministry. The Bible simply calls that maturity. That growing ministry-orientedness, the Bible calls spiritual maturity. And some of you are not stepping into the mission God has for your life or carrying maybe some guilt that you're not doing vocational ministry when you need to see God needs ministers in every stream in our city. Now, that word equip has two primary meanings that shape a lot about what we do. One is to mend, and the other is to prepare for battle. So that word there, mend, it's the same word used in Galatians 6 where it says, anyone caught in a trespass, restore him or her, or or mend them, or equip them in a spirit of gentleness. And so one meaning of the word equip is to mend, to fix, to restore. All of us will go through hard seasons, seasons of marital problems, of addiction, or hard experiences, or a bunch of young kids can make the most sane insane, right? Or a combination of any of those. Uh, Infertility, divorce, failed adoptions, lost jobs, caring for aging parents. Part of our job as church leadership is to create environments and teachings and encouraging relationships that help restore and mend each of us. And so equip or mend shapes a piece of our job as a church. But that second piece also is just as important. And that word equip is to prepare a ship for battle. That dual meaning helps us understand our purpose of our lives. The church at its best is not just a family, but it's a family on mission. It's all of us seeking to live out the gospel. Uh, For many of us who grew up in the Bible Belt like I did, the religious infected church haunted south If you're like me, if you went to church on Sunday mornings because you love the church, if you went to church Sunday morning and you came back Sunday night, you loved the pastor. If you went Sunday morning, came back Sunday night, came back Wednesday night, you loved God, you know, And, and, and the biggest vision cast for us was the most faithful thing we could do is show up and give. And if we're not careful, that terrible paradigm, that unbiblical paradigm is the idea of church is some people come to receive ministry from those like me who went to a seminary and get paid by the church while they actually do ministry. And see, Ephesians 4 turns that upside down. It says, no, this isn't about some people coming to receive ministry from someone who is giving ministry. This is about you and I being equipped so we can go live out the gospel the rest of the week. To use in a football analogy, this isn't the play. This is the huddle. This is where we call the play. I've been fighting for it, and I get voted down every year. I'd love to end every Sunday morning with a big old ready, ready, break, and then we head out to go run the play because that's where the play is run. Every single one of us uh, running the play God has for us, then we're here to equip you. We're here to equip me to go do that. The kid, the parents of the kids our kids hang around with or in class with or on a team with, that's no accident. And what if you and I begin living out this paradigm and understanding this paradigm and going to live out uh, the gospel in the city? Peter would write about this as well. And here's our second verse in 1 Peter 2.9. Peter says to us, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Now, Peter, boy, he goes after three of these. <laughs> if, you got, if you get too loud about any of these, you might get killed, right? The gospel messes our relationship with our race. Imagine that. The gospel calls us into a new race. The gospel calls us to redefine our relationship with our race. We talk about that a lot. We're not going to touch that one today. Look at the third one, a holy nation. The gospel messes with our view of our nationality, our patriotism. we got to thread that needle between being patriotic but not nationalistic. And the gospel calls us into a new nation, redefines our relationship to our country. I'm not going to touch that one today, right? Uh, but that middle one, this royal p- priesthood, the gospel calls us into a new priesthood. We're called to be ministers of the gospel. Now, this is a game changer. This tells us that every single one of us are called to mediate the gospel, now, we, we, we don't live in an Old Testament paradigm. In the Old Testament, you had to be born to a certain tribe to be a priest. You had to be a Levite. And part of the amazing turning everything upside down of Jesus was that he ripped the veil. Remember when he was on the cross, the veil was ripped. We now have access to God, every single one of us, and every single one of us are called to mediate the gospel. That To, to, be, to see yourself as a missionary to your city uh, is to be a Christian, 
that there is a new priesthood and it's sitting in this room and we're called to go live out the gospel in the city. Uh, we don't have an Old Testament paradigm, but a New Testament paradigm that there's a new priesthood and I'm looking at it. And it's our job is to go be pastors and priests in this city as we live out the gospel. The opportunities, the burdens, the privileges of ministry lay on all of our shoulders. Every single one of us are called to evangelize and disciple and to pursue justice and to care for the marginalized and to seek the peace of the city, to initiate for the benefit of others. That's not just the job of a select few. Uh, that's uh, called being a Christian. People often ask me uh, uh, when I got called into ministry, and I'll say the exact same time you did when you became a Christian. That's what it means to be a New Covenant Christian. A New Testament Christian is we trust Christ and we're put on mission for him regardless of who pays our paycheck. Now, can you imagine if every single Christ follower in our city quit minimizing their lives and roles and gifts and saw themselves as Jesus sees them, as a minister of the gospel, as an ambassador of the king, here to do business until he returns, empowered by the Holy Spirit, given a unique set of spiritual gifts? Imagine that. No wonder we get stuck in depression and materialism and addiction and mediocre lives and so many of us do dumb things trying to find life in this life. Part of the reason for that, we minimize our lives to something less than ambassador of the king and we're bored and self-obsessed and that's a horrific combo and ingredients for a life of vanity and trouble. On the flip side, I love seeing so many of you live intentionally with a vision to steward your lives, fully embracing God's mission for your life. Now, vocationally, we're all over the map, but our life calling supersedes our place of employment. You are an ambassador of the king and are, are, are about his purposes. And to that group in here, I would say, keep going. Thank you. May your tribe increase. Something I often hear as well uh, is people will ask me when I decided to go into full-time Christian ministry, or they'll, des they'll describe something like what I do as full-time Christian ministry, and I cannot stand that phrase because it implies there's such thing as part-time Christian ministry. I'm like, my Bible doesn't know anything about part-time Christian ministry, and most probably, here's what I know about that, is, is that... Uh, that tells me that there's an underdeveloped good theology of work or a theology of mothering that's not there or a theology of fathering or a theology of neighboring that we need to do some work on to be able to see us all as full-time ministers of the gospel for the glory of God. One of the reasons we try to maintain a simple church, we're not trying to impress you with how many events we can create to see how many times a week we can get you at something under one roof, is we want you out there. We're minimalist. We want you in your neighborhoods. We want you coaching teams. We want you encouraging uh, those in your friendship circles. We want you opening your dinner tables, your homes, so that you might live out this vision God has for your life. Another way this came alive to me is, think about this. Look at this slide. This is a recent... Those are members of Fellowship Memphis. Every single red dot represents a person or a household that's a member of our city. Now, to use kind of weird terroristic language, imagine if those are like our gospel sleeper cells that got activated. So let's just look at one slice of this. Not work, not family, not even friends. Let's just look at neighboring. What if we had a robust theology of gospel neighboring? And what if every one of those red dots saw themselves, considered themselves to be the chaplain of their street? or the chaplain of their neighborhood? And what if you and I were walking our streets with our kids and simply asking our neighbors, how can we be praying for them? And our family goes on prayer walks. How can we be praying for you? What if we saw ourselves as the welcomer of every new person in the neighborhood and we showed up with the brownies and said hello and introduced ourselves and had people into our homes? What if those were open homes where we knew great gospel hospitality was happening? Uh, what if those were people who cared about those around them? Can you imagine what would happen? Can you imagine what kind of city we, we would live in? The ministry that would be happening every night of the week if each of us just opened opened our eyes, got them off ourselves, and just looked around at the needs around us. That's just neighboring. Imagine if we put another set of dots up where people work. Imagine if we put another set of dots up where people go to school. Imagine if we put another set of dots up where people play. Like in, in, in every place we went, we went with those kind of eyes open to see how can we be a blessing here? How, can, how does God want to use me in this? How can God turn these relationships in a very godly direction uh, and ignite something within the friendship circles I'm in or the street I'm on or the neighborhood I'm in? I, I would argue life would get really, really, really fun and really, really, really fulfilling. 
And I can't think of a better thing for our kids to watch us doing as they get to experience us opening our lives, opening our homes, holding with a very loose grip that which God has entrusted to us. Imagine if we began to see that all that God's entrusted to us is to be stewarded, not just used and lived with, but to be stewarded, that those were tools that he gave us to live out this priesthood of all believers mandate. I get super excited I get way more excited thinking about what that can do Monday through Saturday than how many people we can get in this room for an hour on Sunday. See how lame that is? Like, that's important. I'm glad you're here. That's living out the gospel. Like, a lot of people with jobs like mine and a lot of churches like ours, they just get super excited about how many people they can get in here on a Sunday morning and how many more square feet they can own. Part of the reason you're sitting in a rented facility is we're most excited about that. And what you can do with what God's entrusted to you. One of my slogans I use about an equipping church, that's why we've chosen to be an equipping church, not an event church. We're an equipping church that strategically uses events. But our ultimate end zone is not what happens here on a Sunday. It's what happens out in our neighborhoods and in our lives throughout the rest of the week. And we're constantly trying to cast that vision for you and I to get on mission uh, and to live out the gospel uh, with uh, just beautifully. I think it would be beautiful stories that we could talk about here on a Sunday morning as you and I live out the gospel throughout the week. Well, as we turn to the tables this morning, I hope you're encouraged by what's happening on our college campuses. I hope you're more and more and more seeing God's purpose for your life to live as an ambassador for him. I hope hope we'll be moved to do that, but I don't want to move past Jesus in the midst of that because it's in him and by him and through him and because of him We exist, and at the end of the day, we as Christians and we as a church exist to make much of him. We don't want to just run out and go try to live out the gospel without recognizing and remembering Jesus. He's our reason, he's our source, he's our fuel, he's our everything. And so we make space here at Fellowship Memphis each Sunday uh, to come to the table, to bring our burdens to the table, to bring our guilt to the table, to bring our joy to the table, uh, and to come and remember that he lived a life we couldn't live. He died a death that you and I deserved. He rose again to defeat Satan, sin, and death. Um, and he's building his church. We talked about that last week at the Levitt Shell. That's what Jesus is doing. He's going to be building his church. And you and I living on mission is, uh, is Jesus building his church through us. He's offered us an amazing opportunity uh, to be involved with what he's doing in our city and he's doing in our world. And so we want to come and make Uh, much of him. It's also a time for prayer, and so we'll have some of our pastors, elders, prayer team, anything you want us praying for, uh, we would be honored and privileged to do that and would love to do that. Um, So the tables are open. I'm going to pray for us, uh, and then we'll move into a time of communion. Father, thank you for offering to us salvation and offering to us life. Thank you that we don't have to just exist Uh, meaninglessly here, that you've given us a wonderful, beautiful mandate to make much of you and to get in the game when it comes to doing ministry and living out the gospel. And I pray uh, for every single person here, Lord, for those that don't know you, that maybe today hearing testimony from these guys and uh, hearing the gospel, that maybe today would be their day of salvation. Uh, For any in here who've trusted you, but maybe have never stepped out uh, and served and gotten involved in ministry and in the lives of others, never opened their home, never opened their life, uh, that maybe today you would compel them to do so. Spirit, I just pray you'd press, press us. And for the many in this room I know that uh, live this out, that they're living lives for your glory, their homes are open, their lives are open, they're serving, uh, they're giving, uh, they're, they're living to make much of you. May they be deeply encouraged this morning. May that fa- fire be, uh, fuel be poured on that fire to continue doing that. May they double down on what they're doing. Uh, that is a beautiful investment. And at the end of the day, it will be the only investment that matters. So we love you, Father. Spirit, move in this room. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.